Okay, so this next lecture is going to be on red blood cells, your erythrocytes. And then after this, we're going to talk about platelets. So the first part of this lecture is going to focus a little bit on just blood cells, hematopoiesis, um, which will be relevant both for this lecture as well as our next lecture on platelets. So basically, we're going to talk very briefly about the different red blood cells and how they're made and their structures. And then we're going to go really into more about how the red blood cell functions. What, what does it do? We know a lot of times what it doesn't do. So for example, it um, doesn't have any um, organelles, um, RNA, DNA, etc. So it can't make protein. So it only can do with what it is given during its development. And so we'll talk more about that. So with respect to blood cells, we do have our red blood cells, which is going to be the focus of this lecture. And the red blood cells are going to be, um, or their, their purpose is to carry oxygen. They have other things that they actually do, which we'll talk about more in immunology, but um, their main focus in biochemistry is to move around oxygen. Um, other cells that are important and that are developed um, in your body are going to be, of course, your immune cells. So we have here our lymphocytes, our T cells and B cells, and then we have our innate cells. So our innate cells are going to be our monocyte macrophage lineage, as well as some neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils. Not shown here are going to be other immune cells, such as dendritic cells, but that will come up in um, immunology. And then of course we have platelets, and platelets have their claim to fame in blood clotting, which we will discuss in the next lecture. Now as far as the normal numbers um, go, you don't have to memorize these numbers, but you do have to recognize that neutrophils are the most abundant um, white blood cell in your body. So neutrophils are going to be important in early control of infections, and they are going to also be sort of what is measured to determine if somebody has an infection, elevated levels of neutrophils, for example, as well as um, neutrophils have stages of development like all blood cells, but because there's so many, you can look at how they um, look in the blood and if they are immature, um, you're going to have what's called a shift to the left, um, which basically means you're pumping out, too, you need too many neutrophils, and so you, the blood, bone marrow is releasing them too early before they've actually fully matured, for example. Um, you do have our lymphocytes, T and B cells. Those are, of course, important for our um, viruses, bacteria, etc. We do have eosinophils. These are going to be important for parasite infections, things that are too large uh, for our lymphocytes to handle, things that are outside of your cells, such as worms. Um, your basophils, eosinophils, and mast cells, which is not listed here either, so missing over here are mast cells um, and our dendritic cells, just to be fair to the dendritic cells. But basophils, mast cells, eosinophils all have some sort of role in hypersensitivity reactions, especially the allergic um, response. All right, so hematopoiesis is basically where you take a stem cell uh, in your bone marrow, and this is a pluripotent, let me use yellow, this is a pluripotent stem cell, which means that it can become more than one lineage, um, and so this pluripotent stem cell is going to make other stem cells, and in the case of your um, hematopoiesis, which is occurring in your bone marrow, um, your, your pluripotent stem cell will make your myeloid progenitor stem cells, lymphoid progenitor cell stem cells, and K precursor as well. And you can see in the myeloid progenitor stem cells, you have an eosinophil megakaryocyte progenitor, and then this will, gener will eventually become what we're going to talk about today, our red blood cells, or it becomes a megakaryocyte, which is the going to produce your platelets. And so for the next couple of chapters, this is really the lineage that we will be discussing over here. And then in immunology, we'll take care of the rest of it.
So some things to keep in mind with hematopoiesis is that the cells, including the stem cells, all have, a, have to proliferate. And so they are going to proliferate, um, differentiate, and mature. And things that are driving this are going to be growth factors, um, they're going to be hormones, um, and in general these are often external signals. Um, erythropoietin, for example, is going to stimulate the production of red blood cells, and it doesn't come from within the bone marrow. It's the outside of your body communicating with the bone marrow, saying, we need more red blood cells, so please make them. This is E. Okay, and so one thing to keep in mind with respect to bone marrow as well and hematopoiesis is this is active. So anytime you have a very metabolically active system, unfortunately you have the propensity to form cancers. So we have um, both myeloid and lymphoid lines and you have leukemias, which are going to be immature cells that proliferate. And this is uncontrollable. Okay, so it's that a um, immature form of your, one of your myeloid cells, um, a neutrophil, eosinophil, whatever, but primarily it's going to be immature. So you can look at it, like I said before, under a microscope and you can tell what stage these cells are at. Um, and so it would be a massive expansion of those cells. And what happens with um, your, your immune cells, if they do become cancerous, is they replace and take space up where normal immune cells would normally be. And so you have, instead of um, a very um, uh, diverse uh, white blood cell population, it get, becomes more uniform towards the immature um, proliferating uh, leukemia cell. So this is just a picture to sort of show um, what is happening. So again, the bone marrow is going to be signaled from the outside as to what's going on and what's needed. So if it's a parasitic infection, um, your eosinophils will be um, stimulated to produce more eosinophils, for example. If it's a, a bacteria infection, your neutrophils will be needed, and so your bone marrow will be stimulated to form neutrophils. And so in general, your bone marrow um, stromal cells are going to get the signals and secrete the growth factors that then drive hematopoiesis for a lineage over another. So it's your bone marrow stromal cells. Okay, and so the growth factors are going to drive the production of one particular lineage over another because they all use different growth factors. That's how you can control which one's being made. But again, the hormones, the signals are coming from the outside. Okay, so your hematopoiesis is basically using a um, cytokine signaling pathway that we've already talked about and this is the jack stack pathway. So your ligand, or your growth factor, which is shown here, is basically going to cause your receptors to aggregate. And this is something that your immune system uses a lot, um, and so it, makes sense that your, um, your cells during development will use a lot too, is aggregation of receptors 
and they kind of activate that kind of gets everything going and activating so this is going to activate jack um, and this ha is by phosphorylation there's a uh, receptor tyrosine kinase and jack is going to phosphorylate the um, receptor the cytokine receptor on the tyrosine of the receptor tyrosine kinase um, so jack is going to phosphorylate And you get phosphorylation. Now, after this happens, um, you're going to get STAT, which is signal transducer and activator of transcription. And so STAT is going to get activated and STAT is going to go to the nucleus. They're going to form a dimer, if you remember from Biochem 1. And this dimer will go to the nucleus and this dimer is going to become the transcription factor. Now the other thing that can also happen is you're, you can get the MAP kinase activation. So you're also going to get MAP kinase. And this is going to, of course, have a signal transduction, have another transcription factor, and it's going to go and activate another set of genes. So an overactive signal can become cancer. Okay. Um, and so um, your socks, which is shown here, another color, is going to be able to negatively regulate that. So you can imagine that um, deficiencies of your socks, which silences the, um, the signal transduction pathway, can lead to overactivation and potentially cancer, for example. All right, so just very briefly on our granulocytes, there are three different cells um, that are granulocytes. We have our neutrophils, we have our eosinophils, and we have our basophils. And so our neutrophils are going to have, their cytoplasm is neutral staining. Um, so that's where they get their names, neutrophils. They all have um, lobed, bilobed nuclei. And so that's the same, but this is a cytoplasm stains neutral or smooth. You can think of it as smooth. So when you look at it under the microscope, it doesn't look very granular. It just kind of looks very uniform. Um, Neutrophils are a phagocytic cell, so it eats things, and it's very good at eating bacteria, for example. Um, it's going to have a respiratory burst, generate oxygen radicals, and unfortunately it can do a lot of tissue damage as well. So you really want to control the activation of these guys. And then our eosinophils are going to have granules that are going to stain red. Now eosin, um, um, your, your, your dye basically that is used to stain these cells have an acid and a basic component. And so when the granules are staining red, that means they're staining with the acidic portion of the dye. And so what this means, that the, it means that the granules are basic. And so one reason this is for is because eosinophils have something called their major basic protein. 
and this is critical for protection against parasites. It's one of its mechanisms for destroying the outer layer of actual parasites. Um, and then you have your basophils. And so these are less abundant. And these are going to stain blue. They're granules. Which means, so they're staining blue with the basic dye which means their granules are acidic. Okay, so these are also going to be for allergic responses. They do have histamine stored in vesicles. And so those are the three granulocytes. So when you look at them under a microscope, this one will stay neutral. This one will look red. And this one will have blue granules, or bluish. Um, another lymphocyte population that's important are our mononuclear lymphocytes. So these are our lymphocytes and our monocytes. Um, so lymphocytes are going to be very small and round. So this is a lymphocyte. They're almost the same size as the red blood cells. Um, their nucleus takes up most of their cytoplasm. And there are three types. There's a T cell, a B cell, and a natural killer cell. Um, so T cells get their name from thymus derived. Your B cell comes from actually the bursa fibrisa from birds. But they are also bone marrow derived, it just worked out that way. Um, and then so you're in your natural killer cells are just natural killer cells. Um, monocytes are going to be um, precursors in blood and then they become macrophages in tissues. Okay, and so they have a kidney-shaped nuclei, and they are much larger than um, the surrounding lymphocytes as well as your red blood cells. Um, the macrophage are going to be phagocytic. Again, they eat things. They are going to be tissue resident. So that's very different than our neutrophils. Our neutrophils are going to hang out in the bone marrow. So let me put that up here. The granulocytes are um, uh, stored in the bone marrow. So they, only, they get released um, when needed, primarily, whereas your macrophages are in the tissues. They also are important in removing red blood cells in the spleen. So they're the ones that will remove the red blood cells as they become defective 
um, due to just them circulating over time. And then finally, let's move on to our thrombocytes. So these are going to be our platelets and they're gonna come from our megakaryocytes. So in the bone marrow, you have um, your megakaryocytes. And these are multinucleated. They're giant cells. And so platelets are going to be sort of um, uh, blebs off of these giant cells. So the giant cells um, release platelets Uh, which equal uh, enclosed no oh, yeah sorry just doing that uh, enclosed megakaryocyte membrane plus proteins so everything that is going to be inside of a um, platelet is inside of the cytoplasm of your megakaryocyte because basically the megakaryocyte um, uh, membrane just pinches off and becomes a platelet. So our platelets have no nucleus, are fragments of the megakaryocyte. Okay. So again, so with respect to our um, red blood cells, so with respect to our red blood cells, the major function again is to deliver oxygen. And so in order to do this, the concentration of hemoglobins in the red blood cells has to be high enough to efficiently deliver oxygen. And when the hemoglobin levels fall, um, then a patient becomes anemic. So this is normal hemoglobin levels shown here. And so when hemoglobin levels fall, this is anemia. And there's various versions of anemia as we've talked about before. Okay, so now we're just gonna talk briefly about erythropoiesis. And so erythropoietin, which is going to be released from the kidney, is going to signal the, to the bone marrows to increase red blood cell production and proliferation. And this is going to trigger the stem cells in your bone marrow and say, okay, we need to make more of our red blood cells, um, as it's shown here. Uh, so your red blood cells are, um, is that one so it doesn't get confusing? So your reticulocytes um, are precursors of red blood cells that will have ribosomes. So this is a, has the ribosomes. Um, it has messenger RNA, and it makes hemoglobin. Um, and then your reticular sites are going to mature in the spleen. And then they're going to lose their ribosomes and become red blood cells. And you make about 10 to the 12 red blood cells per day. Um, and they have a half-life of about 45 days. So you're constantly removing red blood cells daily and replenishing your red blood cells daily. Your diet requirements to keep up with the production of these red blood cells are going to be iron, 
you're going to need vitamin B12, and you're going to need folate. All right, and so let's talk a little bit about hemoglobin genes. So we're going to have different chromosomes have different genes on them. And so you can see here that we have our alpha-1 and alpha-2 genes, which are our adult genes. And this is also going to contain the embryonic zeta gene. Okay, so that's within the alpha loci. Now the beta loci, um, here's our beta. Your beta loci is going to contain the embryonic epsilon gene. So this is embryonic. Um, and it's also going to, to also have two copies of the fetal um, beta globulin gene, um, the gamma and the A gamma. So these are both fetal gamma globulin. And then it has two adult genes, which are the delta and the beta. And these are, of course, adult. Now, the order of the genes also parallels the order of expression. So you can see that the embryonic genes are closer to the five prime region. Um, and then the more adult genes are closer to the three prime region of the, um, of the loci, the gene. So you have five prime regions, which have the embryonic and the three prime regions, closer to the three prime regions are gonna be the adults. So the major adult species is going to be um, alpha-2, beta-2. So two chains of alpha, two chains of beta. Fetal hemoglobin is going to primarily be alpha-2, sorry, alpha-2 and your gamma-2. Um, the minor adult species is alpha-2, delta-2. Delta-2. Um, and the fetal hemoglobin, um, the minor, yeah, the minor, um, the um, premature infants, I should say, are going to convert from hemoglobin F to hemoglobin A based on their gestational stage. Um, so fetal hemoglobin is hemoglobin F, so premature have hemoglobin F, which is fetal, and they will transition to hemoglobin A, which is adult, um, and so they'll be born with fetal hemoglobin, and then as they, be, as they mature, they've transitioned to the hemoglobin A. Um, so you have about um, 700 known mutant hemoglobins. Of course, the famous one is um, sickle cell anemia, hemoglobin S, which we've already talked about and you guys know about. Um, and so this is where you have a um, glutamic acid um, for a valine. And then we have hemoglobin C, and this is going to be um, a, a glutamic acid for lysine. Um, and both of these confer malaria resistance. 
All right, and now on to thalassemias. Thalassemias is unequal production of alpha, beta, hemoglobin. Um, and so optimally, your hemoglobin is going to be made up of equal alpha, numbers of alpha and beta globulin chains. And for that equal, they have to be in the proper structure. So your alpha chain um, and beta chain are in a one-to-one -one ratio. So any change of this one-to-one -one ratio is going to alter the stru sorry, structure of your hemoglobin. So if you have a large excess of one subunit over the other, you're going to have a disease called thalassemia. Um, they are very heterogeneous. Um, they arise by many different mechanisms. And like sickle cell, the mutations, thalass some thalassemia mutations can provide resistance to malaria if they're in the heterozygous state. So improper synthesis, of course, causes instability or aggregation, and it can cause diseases in individuals. So if you have a beta plus, um, this means you means you have some beta. If you have a beta zero, this means you make no beta chains. Oops. Uh, so people can often survive with thalassemias um, with persistence of fetal hemoglobin. So hereditary And this is called HPFH, and so this would be an alpha 2, uh, gamma 2. Sorry, let's do hemoglobin. Um, and you can also treat thalassemias, and you can treat sickle cell by trying to increase the um, gamma transcription. And so that can compensate for this disease. All right, so very quickly just talk about um, the development process and switching different hemoglobin genes. So fetal erythropoiesis is going to occur in the liver and the spleen. And this is, of course, the major site. To a lesser extent or to a minor extent. In the last few weeks before birth, your bone marrow will begin to produce red blood cells. So that's about approximately a week 38 of gestation. Um, your bone marrow will start to make your red blood cells. Now, by eight to 10 weeks after birth, the bone marrow is your sole site for making red blood cells. Okay, so the liver and the spleen will contribute a little bit, but by about, um, within about two months or so, two months to three months, your bone marrow is making it all. So the hemoglobin changes with development and partially because both the alpha globulin locus and the beta globulin locus, as we just saw, have multiple genes that are differentially expressed during development. 
Now, just very quickly, the pathophysiology of anemia starts with a decrease in red blood cells, hemoglobin level, or the hematocrit level. Hematocrit level is basically just the ratio of the red blood cell to blood volume. Um, so males have about 45 to 52%. hematocrit, and females are 37 to 48% of their hematocrit. Um, and so a decrease in RBCs, hemoglobin, or decrease in overall hematocrit level is going to decrease your oxygen carrying capacity, which will then lead to hypoxia, which can have multiple effects on different organs, and you're going to have the signs and symptoms of anemia. So symptoms of anemia are going to be many, and I just put, took this from the internet, but added all this in, um, in red are the very severe anemia. So you'll get uh, fainting, chest pain, heart attack potentially, and severe anemia, but there are various effects on your blood and on your body basically due to, of course, your red blood cells not being able to accurately uh, move oxygen around. So anemias can be categorized based on size. Um, and hemoglobin concentration. And that means concentration. Um, so red cells can be of normal size. And so this will be normal acidic. Okay. They can also be small, which is microcytic. And they can be large, which is macrocytic. Cells are, that contain normal hemoglobin are termed no, normochromic. And cells containing decreased hemoglobin are going to be hypochromic. So all of these classifications are going to aid in diagnosis and be important in diagnosis. So your anemias is, again, hemoglobin concentrations are low. And so there are di different causes of this based on morphology as well as the amount of hemoglobin. So if the for um, morphology is microcytic and hypochromic, then this is going to be caused by an impaired hemoglobin synthesis. And so this is going to possibly be caused by a thalassemia, so an inherited trait, or it can be caused by lead poisoning or iron deficiency. So the causes can be different. Um, if you have a macrocytic, normochromic, this implies impaired DNA synthesis which can have vitamin B or folic acid deficiency, which is important, as you know, um, for purines, etc. Or it can be you have a form of leukemia, erythroleukemia. And then, for example, if you have a normocytic, normochromic, this can be caused by simply red blood cell loss. You can have bleeding, sickle cell defects, and things of that sort. So there are also going to be um, common anemias. We have iron deficient anemias. And this is excess loss of iron. 
and women are at risk for during their menstrual cycle as well as um, when they are pregnant. And we also have megaloblastic, megaloblastic anemia, which we've talked about. And this is um, less of your vitamins, so a, um, a deficiency of vitamin B. Or folic acid. Uh, you can also have that bone marrows are producing abnormal red blood cells due to many causes. You can have um, pernicious anemia. And this is a inability to absorb vitamin B12. and hemorrhagic anemia. And this is, of course, blood loss. And this could be caused by stomach ulcers, too. Okay. Um, there are a few other types of anemias. Um, there's hemolytic anemia. This here. And this is where the RBC membrane ruptures. And this can be caused by infections. Um, there is of course, thalassemia, which you have less synthesis of hemoglobin, sickle cell anemia, which we've already talked about because that has your sickle cell, uh, different shape of your red blood cells. And then finally, aplastic anemia. And aplastic anemia is destruction of bone marrow. And this can be caused by toxins or gamma radiation. All right, so finally we're up to erythrocyte metabolism. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time on this particular um, slide here. So, Erythrocytes, of course, have no intracellular granules, and so all of their enzymes um, are limited to what is found in the cytoplasm. Okay. Um, in addition, your hemoglobin um, to, uh, well, in addition to having a lot of hemoglobin, so they do have a lot of hemoglobin, um, they also contain enzymes necessary for um, prevention and repair of damage, and this would be due to primarily oxygen species. So major proteins are hemoglobin, I can put it down here. Hemoglobin, of course, and also glycolysis and protection from oxygen damage. And they're moving around oxygen, so they can generate a lot of reaction oxygen species. Um, erythrocytes can only make 
energy through glycolysis. All right, so that's shown there in that pink. Um, and the energy is going to be And the energy is going to be needed to um, iron transport across the cell membrane. And this is primarily going to be sodium, potassium, and calcium. Um, and also has to phosphorylate membrane proteins and also, of course, just doing glycolysis. Now, glycolysis is going to generate your ATP. So we have glycolysis. And of course, we're generating ATP. And so your, um, your um, glycolysis, again, is going to be the only form of energy. There's no TCA cycle um, for your erythrocytes. In addition, your erythrocytes have another process that's important. It's called the rapoport lumber shunt. And this generates a compound called 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Sorry, I can't fit it. All right, 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So that's a 2,3-BPG. 2,3-BPG um, is key. And the reason is because it's a modulator of oxygen binding to hemoglobin. So what it does is it stabilizes the deoxy form of hemoglobin. Um, and facilitates the release of oxygen into the tissues. Kind of think of it as a placeholder in a way. And another thing that's important is binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. And so this requires iron, of course. So that's over here. Um, and so in order to bind oxygen, iron of hemoglobin must be in the ferrous state. Um, the reactive oxygen can oxidize ferrous to ferric, um, and this will produce um, methemoglobin. It's the ferric state. Um, and then this will bind oxygen and produce methemoglobin. Um, now NADH is going to um, be regenerated, or it can regenerate hemoglobin from methemoglobin and that's through NADH cytochrome B5. So NADH produced from glycolysis um, can reduce cytochrome B5, and a cytochrome B5 can convert methemoglobin 
um, to your ferrous iron state, uh, iron state in order to be able to bind to hemoglobin. Okay, so this whole portion right here is referred to as an NADH cytochrome B5. methemoglobin reductase system. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Um, now, the other thing that has to happen is you have to protect the red, the red blood cell from oxygen damage. And to do this, they have the hexose monophosphate shunt. Let's do a different color here. About 5 to 10% of glucose is going to be metabolized um, in the red blood cell to generate um, your NADPH via the hexose monophosphate shunt. So that's the same um, process that we talked about with respect to your um, pento pentose phosphate pathway. However, of course, your red blood cells are not going to be making um, DNA, so those five carbon sugars are not going to be used to make your uh, ribose, deoxyribose. Instead, they're going to be fed back into um, your glycolysis through fructose 6-phosphate, as we talked about in your pentose phosphate pathway. That doesn't change. But the most important thing is you're generating NADPH. The critical thing about NADPH is it keeps glucathion in a reduced state. So NADPH will keep glucathione in a reduced state. And glucathione is um, going to be one of the most important red blood cell defenses against damage caused uh, to proteins and lipids by those reactive oxygen species. So again, the first enzyme is going to be that glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Which is the same as that pentose phosphate pathway. And the red blood cell lifetime correlates with the activity of this enzyme. So in general, you have four things going on that are important for your red blood cell. You have one, which is glycolysis. Two is you have your rapoport linger shunt, which is going to generate that 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and that is going to help to stabilize hemoglobin so that the oxygen can be released to tissue. You're going to have to keep um, your um, iron in the ferrous state in order to bind to hemoglobin, and then you're going to have to protect the red blood cell from oxidizing through the hexose monophosphate shunt. All right, so now moving into heme synthesis. So heme synthesis occurs in the precursors of the red blood cell. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, it's a complex pathway. It's always going to originate from succinyl-CoA and glycine. 
Um, mutations in the steps for heme synthesis can lead to diseases known as the um, phorias. Um, so what to keep in mind is that your red blood cell membrane is, has to be a little bit flexible and that's because it has to go from your arteries and your veins into your capillaries um, and it has a very complex cytoskeletal structure that allows it to do this. So it's going to have a lot of proteins like spectrin, anchorin, and what's called the band 3. Uh, mutations in any of these Um, can also lead to loss of red blood cells. And these would be your um, spectrin, your anchorin, and something called band 3. And so there are basically two major deficiencies of red blood cells that can really limit the, um, the ability of the red blood cells to move around oxygen, and that's the mutations of skeleton genes or defects of heme synthesis. Uh, I think that's good. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So heme is, of course, a porphyrin ring, and it has iron in the center, shown here. Um, it's going to be complex to proteins in hemoglobin, myoglobin, um, as well as in cytochrome P450 enzymes. And so heme is really the most common porphyrin in the body. It has four um, hyrule rings with um, carbon-hydrogen bridges that are joining them, and it can also have various side chains. And heme, of course, is red in color. Now, heme synthesis, again, you're just starting with succinyl-CoA and glycine, as mentioned before. And this is going to form um, a delta amino malonic acid. So that's the first thing that gets made, a delta ala. Um, now, each heme is going to need um, eight of each of these, and in the final step, you're going to get the actual incorporation of your ferrous iron. Now, heme is synthesized, again, with glycine and succinyl-CoA, and they're going to condense, and this is by this synthase, and this is also the regulated step. So um, heme will feed back and negatively regulate itself. Um, d synthase also requires pyridoxal phosphate. And this is because glycine is going to get decarboxylated. The next reaction is by a hydratase, and this is where two molecules of d ala are going to condense. So you have two of these. 
and these will condense. Um, and these are going to form a pyrrole called porphobilinogen. And then four of these pyrrole rings will condense to form linear chains in a series um, of porphyrogens. And then the final step, you'll add iron. Um, and the final step reaction is a ferroketolase that is going to um, catalyze this reaction. So another thing that's happening with respect for heme synthesis is sort of the location. So I'm going to really quickly just draw out the location. So you have your cell. And you have your uh, mitochondria. Draw the mitochondria big. So this is the mito. Oops, sorry. More space. There's your mitochondria. And so basically in the mitochondria you have your succinyl CoA and glycine. And these are going to start everything in the form of the D-ALA. And then, sorry, that should be an A. And then this is actually going to go into the cytoplasm. And you're going to get steps two through five in your cytoplasm. And then you're going to get your copropyl um, thyrinogen 3. Where are you? Oh, here it is. And that's going to go back into the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, you're going to eventually add iron and form heme. And then this, of course, is a negative regulator of that first enzyme, which is the synthase. And so basically, heme starts in the mitochondria, moves to the cytoplasm, and ends in the mitochondria, where the product can negatively regulate that first step for making more heme or not. Now, a few notes. Oh, I should say a few things here. Here are our phorias. Um, and you can see that they're kind of, some of them are named for the enzymes. So for the first, the first porphyria is the delta ALA dehydratase porphyria. So that means you have a deficiency of that dehydratase. Um, you have the deaminase, which is acute intermittent uh, porphyria. You have some congenital erythropoietic porphyria. You have your porphyria cutana tarda, which is the your porphyrogen decarboxylase, so that is also occurring in the cytoplasm. And then once you go back into the mitochondria, if you have a deficiency of the oxidase, that's another type of hereditaria porphyria. Um, and then you have a porphyria for an oxidase, and the second oxidase in your mitochondria. And as well as a ferroketolase, you have your erythropoietic um, protophoria. So those are the phorias for associated with heme um, production. And of course, they're all going to be deficiencies rather than loss of function. So just a note about heavy metals. Heavy metals are going to have inhibition of the ferroketolase. And this equals plumism, a lack of iron incorporation um, into that protoporphyrin uh, 9. Oh, I spelled that wrong, sorry. Four. 
and this is leads to no heme generation. And so you have no inhibition of that first step. Um, making that ALA. Uh, and so you have accumulation of ALA in the blood. Um, and then in addition to this, your erythroblasts, so the cells that are um, precursors to erythrocytes, are going to acquire what are called sideromes which are accumulations that you can view actually under a microscope. And these are basically iron deposits in the mitochondria. Um, zinc will also, if it's zinc, zinc can also incorporate into that protoporphyrin 9. And this will form zinc protoporphyrin. Or ZPP. And ZPP has a fluorescent quality and it can, uh, under a certain wavelength, you can see erythrocytes actually glowing which can then suggest that you have a heavy metal um, poisoning. So that can be sort of diagnostic for that. All right, so next up is regulation of heme biosynthesis. So heme is going to be synthesized in all cells at very low levels, except for, of course, the rich, mature red blood cell. And then also the liver is going to synthesize about or have about 15% of the heme. And then your RBC precursors and your erythroid cells that have matured will have about 85% of the heme in the body. So heme regulation in the liver is um, rate limiting step again is that ALA synthase um, heme is a co-repressor of ALA synthase gene expression Um, and it also is a negative regulator of the actual enzyme. So this is feedback, of course. 
Um, so there are some pharmacological drugs um, that are metabolized by the CYP450 enzymes, as we've talked about. And so an increase in heme utilization occurs when using these drugs. Um, barbiturates should not be prescribed for pain associated with perforios, because of course then you're using up whatever little heme an individual is making. So note Um, so again, with respect to your red blood cell for regulation, you have to remember that all the heme is being synthesized in the immature red blood cells, and the mature red blood cells cannot make more heme. So for, um, let me move this. Just going to throw that note up there. So for our um, regulation, in the red blood cell, so the heme must survive the life of the red blood cell. And this can be up to 120 days. Okay, um, and the heme has to um, activate protein synthesis in our red blood cell precursors. So the regulation of heme, again, is going to um, be at multiple levels of enzymes in, within the precursor red blood cell. And regulation is going to be at the level of the ALA synthase, your ferroketolase, and also your porphyrobilogen deaminase. Now, heme also gets degraded, of course. Um, red blood cells are primarily going to be degraded in the spleen. So here's your red blood cell, and they'll be um, degraded in the spleen. They can also be degraded in the liver, if necessary, places like that. Red blood, um, macrophages are in every tissue, so in theory, any macrophage can degrade a, a bad red blood cell, but it primarily gets done in the spleen. Um, you are going to release hemoglobin, so hemoglobin is going to get released. And then you're going to have them separated. So your globin is going to be separated from your heme. Um, and this will also be the process for your cytochrome P450s, and your myoglobin will get degraded, your heme will get released. Um, now, heme is basically porphyrin and iron. Um, and so you're going to get release of your iron. Um, and then your heme gets converted to bilirubin. <laughs> 
And so that's sort of shown over here where you have your heme, and then you have a heme oxygenase, which will release that iron. Um, and then you get biliviridin, and then you have a biliviridin reductase, which requires NADPH, and this is going to lead to bilirubin. Um, and then once you have bilirubin, bilirubin is going to bind to albumin and then get transported to the liver. So remember, albumin moves things through the blood. And so the albumin is going to transport the bilirubin to the liver. Um, and then once in the liver, your liver does what it normally does. It's going to make this more soluble. So it's going to use UDP gluconerate. And the albumin, of course, is going to be recycled by your liver. And you create a bilirubin um, digluconeride. And this is going to go into the bile. And then it's going to move through the um, digestive tract, can interact with bacteria. Bacteria can metabolize um, and convert bilirubin digluconeride to urobilogen. So that's what bacteria do. I'm just going to draw this arrow. So it's bacteria. I have to rewrite that. Um, and then the unabsorbed urobilogen is going to be excreted. Sterocobilin is also going to be excreted. Okay, so that's kind of what I already did, so I'm not going to. Um, uh, basically go through this again. All right, so now some clinical things going on with heme metabolism. You have your hyperbilirubin hemias. Um, so basically, again, in the liver, you have conjugation of gluconerate to bilirubin. So um, bilirubin conjugation And this can be measured by an Ehrlich diazole reagent. And this equals direct measurement. And you can also measure unconjugated bilirubin um, in a lab with the addition of alcohol. We put this using alcohol. And that's an indirect measurement. And so basically what you're looking for is what's the total bilirubin level circulating. So normal levels of bilirubin are about zero, ooh, sorry. 0 0.3 to 1.2 mil per deciliter. And if you have a hyperbilirubinemia, which you have a yellow-orange discoloration of tissues, usually seen um, in the sclera of the eyes, then you have an elevated level beyond the normal. 
Um, there's also going to be bilirubin toxicity. Oops, sorry about that. Need more space. Um, and so this can lead to an encephalopathy, which can be life-threatening in newborns. So people have heard of bilirubin toxicity, which is an intense, which presents as an intense jaundice. And this is going to be in newborns. Um, so why is this such a problem? Is because bilirubin can inhibit DNA synthesis. Bilirubin can uncouple oxidative phosphorylation. I'm just going to say it's an uncoupler. You guys know what an uncoupler is. Um, it can inhibit ATPase activity. Um, it can also inhibit many enzymes. It's going to inhibit dehydrogenases, hydro, hydrolases, RNA synthesis, electron transport proteins. Um, there are some inherited disorders associated with um, bilirubin as well, as well. There is Gilbert syndrome. Um, and there's also Dubin-Johnson and Rotor syndrome. Um, and so the Gilbert syndrome, uh, also Krigler-Narra syndrome, is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, which is severe. And then the Dubin Johnson is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, which is less severe since it's soluble. And then we have finally clinical, or getting to finally, hopefully, clinical aspects of your perforias. So you can have inherited or acquired erythroid or hepatic. Um, perforia cutanea tarda is the most common defect. And this can have type 1, which are defects in the function of your liver enzyme. And then you can have type 2, which are defects um, of your UROD gene, so your decarboxylase gene.
and that would just be basically global. Um, and so the most common is a hepatic or liver acute intermittent phoria. Um, so what's going to cause or what are the symptoms of the porphyrias? You're going to have a, an increase in excretion of heme byproducts. So when things accumulate, you have to get rid of it. You can have red urine. Uh, deposits in the skin make skin sensitive to the sun and this causes ulceration. Um, you can have an um, increase of hair growth, fine hair over the entire face, and this is known as the werewolf syndrome. You can also have red brown teeth. Okay, so we have iron deficiencies, which are common. So we, of course, have our sources of iron, which can come from the diet. Um, we're going to absorb your ferrous form of iron. Um, and so this is going to be um, picked up and then transported. So you have a ferrooxidase, um, which is then going to um, convert it to transferrin. And then transferrin can go throughout the body. It's going to go into the liver and it's going to be stored as the hemosiderin form. Um, but your transferrin also needs to go to make your cytochromes, um, it can go to erythropoiesis to make your red blood cells, um, etc. And so what's important to know is storage protein apoferritin forms a complex with the um, transferrin. And when you have excess iron absorbed from the diet, it's going to be stormed in a more, um, I guess, permanent form, which is hemosiderin. So ferritin is going to be an easily tapped form. So easy access. And this is, hemosiderin is going to be hard to access. But it still is a stored form. Okay, so you have all that. Um, your iron is going to be oxidized to the ferric state. Uh, by a ferrous oxidase, and this is uh, called the seroplasm. It's a copper-containing enzyme, which is shown here. Um, and then, of course, you have your excretion and iron loss, and so that can be in many forms um, of iron. So an overview, here's the red blood cell life cycle. The red blood cell is going to circulate for up to 120 days. That time frame is going to depend largely on glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase and going into that pentose phosphate pathway to make sure glucathione stays reduced. That's going to have a major impact on the lifespan of your red blood cell. Um, you, of course, are going to remove your red blood cells in primarily the spleen um, by your macrophages. It can also be done, of course, in other tissues as well. This is going to result in the release of heme. Um, it's going to become eventually biliveridin to bilirubin. Um, you're going to go into the small intestine and you're going to have your bacteria work on this and it's going to be excreted. You also pick up um, your iron. Uh, it's going to be transported as transferrin. goes into the liver, becomes ferritin. Um, it can become hemocidrin um, if you have too much and it's going to move around the body.
So now just a little bit about the red blood cell membrane. So the red blood cell membrane is going to be a biconcave shape. And its biconcave shape is what's going to maximize the surface area. It is going to be able to deform It has to deform to get through capillaries. Um, and the spleen, of course, is going to remove them. Um, so when the red blood cell will pass through the kidneys, and the red blood cell passage through these are going to go through a hypertonic area. Um, and then it's going to go back again. So red bloods tend to shrink um, and they tend to expand as they travel and so they can be damaged. It's thought that the red blood cell passes through the spleen about 120 times per day. Now the cytoskeleton of the red blood cell is also designed for it to be flexible. Um, so damaged red blood cells that can't go through capillaries are going to become trapped in passages and typically because they go through the spleen so much they're more than likely to get trapped in the spleen and that's why they're going to be destroyed. The deformability of getting and moving through the body is going to be in the shape of the proteins that make up its membrane. And so you're going to have a um, membrane on the cytoplasmic side um, that forms a two-dimensional lattice that gives the red blood cell its flexibility. So all of this is giving it its flexibility. The major proteins are going to be spectrin. So we have major proteins. We have spectrin, we have actin, we have band 4.1, band 4.2, and anchorin. So multiple spectrin, spectrins can bind to each actin filament and this results in branched cytoskeleton. Um, and then so your spectrin cytoskeleton is going to be connected to the membrane lipid layer by anchorin. Um, so anchorin is what anchors, you can think of it that way, so it connects the cytoskeleton to the membrane. And anchorin is going to interact with um, B spectrin and, the, and an integral membrane protein called band 3. So here we have anchorin bound to your um, spectrin, and this is going to interact with your band 3 protein. Your band 4.1, which is shown here, your band 4.1 is going to anchor the spectrin skeleton with the membrane, and this binds to the integral membrane protein glycophorin C. So here's glycophorin C and actin. So band 4.1 binds actin plus glycophorin. Your band 4.2 is going to bind to glycophorin A. And then you have your anchorin, which is going to bind to band 3. Alright, so just really quickly, we've already talked about this, myoglobin versus hemoglobin. 
we have uh, myoglobin has a single O2 binding site, um, whereas hemoglobin is a tetramer with four binding sites. Tetra means four. Um, so myoglobin has one molecule of heme. Um, and the adult versions have two alpha and two beta chains. So we've already talked about all that. Um, so with respect to hemoglobin binding, again, you have your relaxed state um, where your O2 binds high affinity. And then you have your T or tense st state. Um, and so this is more stable when oxygen is absent. And it's the predominant form of deoxyhemoglobin. Um, binding of oxygen, of course, will trigger the change from, to a more relaxed state. Again, cooperativity, we've talked about this also. We have uh, myoglobin, which is going to have a hyperbolic binding curve. Um, and so binding, if you had to use myoglobin, myoglobin would bind to oxygen in the lungs, but it would not be able to release it in the tissues. And so um, hemoglobin has a sigmoid binding curve. And as we talked about in Biochem 1, it's going to transition from the tout state to the more relaxed state as more oxygen binds. And it has the ability to release oxygen when it actually gets into tissues, whereas your myoglobin will hold on to oxygen. Um, we have cooperativity within the hemoglobin. As one oxygen binds, it makes it the other oxygen subunits have an easier time to bind to the, the other portions of the molecule. Um, and so the first oxygen is binding weakly, and then you get a conformational change, and it allows other oxygens to bind to the hemoglobin molecule. We also talked about previously the ability of hemoglobin to transport hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And this goes back to our red blood cells and our carbonic anhydrous. Um, so these are the end products of all your cells and cellular respiration are going to be excreted in the kidney and lungs. And so in order to get them to the kidney and lungs, they need to be transported by the red blood cells. And so this is going to involve heme. Um, carbon dioxide is also going to be hydrated and this is going to form bicarbonate. Um, and then you're going to catalyze all of this by carbonic anhydrase, which is very high in your red blood cells. Um, and so the reason you have to form your bicarbonate is CO2 is not soluble, and it would form bubbles. So CO2 becomes your um, bicarb. Oops, bicarb. Um, conversion of CO2 to bicarb is going to increase hydrogen. Um, and so you're going to have a decrease of tissue pH. And the change in tissue pH is the key to the oxygen release. So conversion. And then a decrease of tissue pH um, is going to um, 
inversely relate to the binding of oxygen, so it's going to allow the oxygen to be released into the tissues. And oxygen is um, likes electrons, and so the mitochondria and the electron transport chain actually in the cells is going to help to draw in that oxygen. Um, last couple of slides. So we have the Bohr effect. So in the tissues, you have low pH plus high CO2. And you have um, high CO2 affinity for hemoglobin. Just draw this a different way. Um, the you have low pH and high CO2. Start with that. High CO2. And this results in the affinity for hemoglobin for oxygen to decrease. And that goes down, decreases. Um, and so oxygen gets released into the tissues. Um, and so in the lungs, in the lungs, um, you have CO2 is excreted. And so the pH is going to rise. And as the pH increases, the affinity for hemoglobin, uh, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen increases. So the effect of carbon dioxide and pH on the binding and release of oxygen by hemoglobin is known as the Bohr effect. So just a few side notes about your 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate is going to be very high in red blood cells, um, and a, a great amount of this is going to be bound to hemoglobin. So 2 3 bisphosphoglycerate is going to compete um, with oxygen for binding. And this is an allosteric competition. Um, and so it's going to change or alter the ability of your hemoglobin to bind to oxygen. So at low O2, which for example is high altitudes, your 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate um, concentrations in your red blood cells rise. Um, and this has no effect on oxygen binding in the lung. This will increase the release of oxygen to tissues. And this is also occurs in people who are suffering from hypoxia. Now, in a fetus who gets oxygen from mother, um, you're going to have fetal hemoglobin, which has a higher affinity for oxygen. And this is via the gamma subunits.
Um, so the uh, fetal hemoglobin is able to attract oxygen from the mother because of the higher affinity. Okay, so in summary, your 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate um, is going to bind the, uh, allosterically to the four subunits of hemoglobin. Um, and this is going to lower the affinity for oxygen and release oxygen to tissues. Um, the Bohr effect also will also affect this. So an increase of protons lowers the affinity For, of, he, of hemoglobin for O2. And CO2 can bind to hemoglobin or form bicarbonate, which also impacts this. So although CO2 produced by metabolism in the tissues does get carried to the lungs as bicarbonate. Um, some CO2 does bind to the hemoglobin. And in tissues, carbon dioxide can form carbamate adducts with the um, deoxyhemoglobin, and this stabilizes the deoxy conformation of that molecule. So CO2 can form. So, but in the lungs, when you have high levels of CO2, the oxygen is going to outcompete, bind to the hemoglobin, and then the CO2 will be released. Okay, and so that is the end of this lecture.